my name is Dr. Rachel Chapman, and my channel is for anyone who cares about language, comma, technology, and other people. And today I am joined by Katria, who you may know as Katria Doodles. And do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and talk about, well, I guess people can see the video title, but talk about <laughs> the intersection of caring about technology and other people that we're going to cover today. My name is Katria and I'm an author and illustrator. So far I've mainly worked for Serbian publishing, but I hope to branch out in international market next year. I cared about technology only in terms of like learning new programs up until a few months ago, then a whole new door opened for me. And right now I am in over my head in like a lot of research papers. And right now it appears that it's very important for artists to be well educated into this topic because, well, if we were to believe the marketing speak, this technology is coming for us all and we need to adapt or die. I don't personally subscribe to that belief, but it, it's a predominant like thing that people are saying now. And yeah. so I'm doing my part and educating myself and trying to help others learn more about this. Yeah, definitely. You're a part of a, a segment of people that we in machine learning don't always make an effort to reach out to, and that is people whose data we have. <laughs> let, me put it, <laughs> let me put it that way. For those of you who, who watch it, we read the paper that Abeba Berhane and co-authors did on the Lion 400M data set, which is the data set used to train stable diffusion. Certainly stable diffusion one, I'm not entirely sure the training data for two, and I think that they're going to be doing some additional reduction for three, it sounds like. I mean, that's what they've said publicly, but you know, who knows. And we've talked about some of the, the really big issues with that data set, right? It contains a lot of um, images of sex workers, probably without their consent. It contains images of people who are having violence and sexual violence done unto them, almost certainly without their consent or knowledge. I saw, we haven't talked about this on the channel, but I recently saw an investigation that found that there were personal medical photos of individuals, right? So there's a lot of PII, there's a lot of images of people, there's a huge bias in what is included in this data set, in addition to, you know, a lot of data that I would never condone being used to train a model for general use, let me put it that way. It's something that's negatively affecting, in particular, women, in particular, people of color, you know, folks who are from Asian heritage or who are black. So lots and lots of issues on that side and the ethics on that side. But there is another group of people that we haven't, again, in the field, I don't think been Sometimes we're not the most responsible as a field, and <laughs> I hope that we can get better, right? This is something I've been thinking about a lot, which is why I wanted to talk with Katria. It also includes a lot of art. So it includes things that people have done, both, you know, for their enjoyment, but also things that are a big part of their professional lives. And in some cases, things that they may be sharing as part of their portfolios that they couldn't even, if they had wanted to, allow yeah, redistribution yes. of. So Katria, I think it would be really helpful, folks on my channel, if you talk a little bit about what it is that artists do, because I think there's a little bit of, for people outside the field and or who don't know a lot of artists, I think there's a lot of romanticization and maybe incorrect ideas about what it's like to do art professionally. And also the impacts on, on you and other artists of having your art harvested in this way, and then the secondary impacts of the models being trained on it. So huge can of worms, go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to come up with a way to cover everything right now. Okay, so the thing is, I am a book illustrator. I also do private commissions for people and I've done some design work as well. And the thing is, it's just one of the many possible professions, like separate, separate fields that one can go into when doing art professionally. The only thing that's common for all, all of us is that we make money doing art. And I realized like maybe it's, uh, maybe I don't need to talk about that on this channel, but just in case someone like stumbles upon this video and is under the impression that like doing art for money is devaluing art or something like that, I, I would strongly disagree because even the commercial art that we do is still filled with a lot of our own personal expression, our own like personal value and like human value is infused into that work, even though it's done for money and art is a profession. It isn't something we do for fun or, well, not most of us do it for fun in our free time. There are certainly hobbyists, but we are talking about professional artists here and the effects this technology has on our professions and our livelihoods. So the way I do work, I work with clients as a book illustrator is going to be a lot different than someone who is a concept artist or a texture artist or a 3D artist. And I'm sure each of those professions is going to have a lot of different problems 
when it comes to the to this technology what i can say for me personally the way i do work right now with clients involves a lot of back and forth with them like i need to be able to really go into the illustration and make every single like the tiniest change possible manually and i don't think that is automated right now or that it's planning to be automated right now i know there's stuff like in painting and stuff like that but trust me it's not enough when it's very important client work you really need to be able to go in and well by the time i do the in painting and stuff i would probably be faster on it's like just doing it manually so yeah that's one big part is the client feedback in the work i do so you talked about just to to summarize the different ways that you work, that you work primarily for commission, it sounds like. And I, I mean, my my channel icon, as I've, I've mentioned before on the channel, I, I commissioned someone to do it. And we had a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, change this, one change that. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's the, I do with, I work with private commissioners, but mm -hmm. also with traditional publishers in Serbia and self-publishers internationally. And it pretty much boils down to the same type of work being, like the same type of relationship, client artist relationship. So yeah, it applies everything I do. So that's the current state of the art, how artists make money. Let's sure. start talking about the data harvesting, I guess, is one way to, uh, yeah. to think about it. So we've talked about some of the like morally <laughs> reprehensible things that are in, in various yeah. computer vision data sets that are sort of scraped from the internet, but it also includes a lot of art right people things that people have done yes. and as you mentioned primarily as part of their profession i think it's similar with programming right like a lot of people go to their job and they program and they do it for work and that is their labor and yes. the fruit of their labor is the program yeah the the only dis dis distinction i would make there is that like from all the research i've done i have a feeling that the programming community like the entire sphere operates a lot differently than art mm. in the sense that open source is a lot more valued mm. it's something that like programming usually is like a communal effort while art can also be done in teams, but it's primarily like a very individual and personal effort. And I don't think that needs to be changed. Hmm. I've noticed a lot of people call back to the open source and like the openness of the programmers to share their, their stuff with others, but I don't think that needs to apply here in any sort of way. And oh. the yeah, the art we do is automatically copyrighted to us mm -hmm. in the US for sure. I think it's in Serbia as well. <laughs> Last time I did that research, it appeared that way. We hold copyright to everything we do unless we sign it away in very like detailed contracts, very specific contracts. And if we sign that right away, we may still get a written permission to post it on our portfolios or stuff, but we don't have copyright to those images. So even if we wanted to license them to someone else, we couldn't because we gave those rights way and in the middle somewhere in the middle of that the middle of us owning all the copyright and the company owning everything we can license particular images for particular companies for a set amount of time for a set like for the set use very specific so for those of you who noticed that i i don't think you can actually see this country but i have like a little background with some art on it so this <laughs> is something that i pay to be able to use I have like a, a general license that covers a lot of different types of stock images but i pay to be able to use those professionally right with everything that i've explained with how mm -hmm. we license our work that's where the unethical uh, moment happens mm -hmm. with the uh, scraping of these data sets. Mm -hmm. It will have to be proven in court. It might even be illegal. We'll have to wait and see because there's no case law yet. So right now, uh, for me personally, it's highly unethical, mm -hmm. at least because it was the data was scraped, like copyrighted material was scraped without our knowledge, consent, or compensation. And it could be argued that maybe like someone could even end up in trouble because copyrighted artwork that they didn't have the right to anymore got scraped from their own website or from their own art station profile and stuff like that. But apart from that, like the biggest harm is felt on the way these models are used. They mm -hmm. keep saying like the companies behind this keep saying it's a tool, but as it stands, it's more of a replacement. <laughs> and like an unethically trained replacement to that the artist didn't have any say in it and you know like 
if the data was collected ethically who knows how many artists would even like sign up for that that's a really good point so we've talked a little bit about how artists generally work and make money and this tool has been created and it's certainly being sold as hey you don't have to pay artists anymore you can pay us <laughs> to use our api but that clearly is a material harm to people there's definitely been some cases in the past that i think more focused on on text and text data than image data i'm Neither of us are lawyers. Yeah. Talk to a lawyer and maybe yeah, hire exactly. a lawyer because things are changing very quickly. But there's two, a couple of threads I want to pull on here. And one is you mentioned open source. And this is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. And I talked about it on the channel a while ago with the, the folks from Mantis NLP. I think there's been a conflation of open source code, you know, permissively licensed data and access to models, right? Those are three separate things. So open sourced code has a long history and it was a countercultural movement against large computer monopolies, right? A lot of the early open source movement was very focused on helping break the monopoly that Microsoft had. So there was a strong ideological bent to it. The community that I've been involved with, you know, off and on in the past, but it is specifically about code. The source is source code. And then there is data collection and curation and, and open data. So there are some open data movements. A lot of the movements around government data, I would say, are one of those. So you'll you'll hear people talk about like a sunlight or open government or open data, but that is for data that is, in terms of licensing, if it's been collected by certainly the US government, it's in the, the public domain, right? It is not covered by copyright. And you also have a second thing there, which is that, you know, you can't, copyright, again, in the US, small pieces of data, right? Like I can't be like, I've copyrighted zip codes, screw you. <laughs> but <laughs> you can copyright or you can maintain IP for the organization of data, right? So there is the database and how it's organized. And then there's the third thing, which is the models themselves. So you can open source the data for the model, right? You can share the data you use to train the model, which is sort of like a, a big part of this picture, right? Is do you have licenses to redistribute that data? And then there's the model itself. And something that's particularly interesting in the generative model world, so I'm of course more familiar with large language models, but we're reading, <laughs> this will be in the past, we will have read on my stream a paper on memorization in generative images as well. So having a model that generate images that look very, very similar to specific prompt images, which is, you know, again, copyright question mark, right? We're, we're very much in a situation where there's not established law right now, yeah. where the technology is moving much more quickly than the legal system or the legislative system. Them. And also it's a global thing, right? Like your uh, country is in, in Serbia, I'm in the US. We are covered by different copyright laws, right? If people keep talking about global copyright law, which as if it is a single, <laughs> there's a yeah, single yeah, IP no, there, umbrella. Yeah, there's no such thing. The only mm -hmm. thing like that connects copyright laws from other countries is the Bern Convention. There are several exceptions from that, like I think six countries in the world. And also certain, you know, embargoes and sanctions may or may not cover data output because it certainly covers software output from specific countries as well. So talk to a lawyer, we're not lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> which is why, you know, you, if you are selling software in the United States, you cannot, you know, make that software accessible to people in certain other countries, depending on the political and legal landscape at the given time. So the issue there is that the model to some degree, redistributing the model also redistributes the data. This is my understanding based on a lot of research. I might be wrong, so I'm open to being corrected. Okay, so the common crawl scrapes the web mm -hmm. and the lion composite data set don't exactly contain images. They mm -hmm. contain well, links. However, a lot of people try to use that as like an excuse, like a gotcha moment, a loophole. However, that distinction without a difference, it's basically the same thing. You are training the model on a copyrighted is far too. There's also another um, potential loophole where the these models don't contain either the URLs or the images within themselves, like within the their code. They are like four gigabytes big. <laughs> these models can actually output the copyrighted image, like the prompt, the image they were trained on. And there has been a myriad of examples of overfitting. So there are a lot of potential loopholes, but it all boils down to the model being able to 
like being trained on the copyrighted artworks and being able to output those exact images or images similar enough to be considered uh, direct plagiarism. I think there's also a point to be made about overfitting versus memorization, right? So some folks in my audience might not, may not know the difference. So overfitting is you rely too much on a specific data set or data point or you know, have have created a model that is more like your training data than the, the broader sort of situation you're trying to model. And memorization is the process of looking at a specific data point and memorizing it, and then in a generative setting, later being able to, you know, regurgitate it. And the more parameters your model has, right, the more weights and connections, the more likely it is to memorize. And I think we're beginning to see evidence. We have pretty strong evidence from like large language models that they memorize even single instances. Again, I haven't seen strong evidence that suggests that that's not happening. Hard to prove a negative, but basically when people look for it, they tend to find it. And it appears that there's might be starting to find similar evidence about that for these generative image models. So. Yes. The memorization is I have your, your specific piece and I can copy it from you know memory in a, in a way that is more or less equivalent. And it, one of the big issues with these really big models is we don't know how to untrain on a specific data point, right? Open question in machine learning, people have been working on it for, for many years and we just don't have it, right? So I cannot guarantee, you know, that I can transform a model in a way that means that the information contained in a specific data point, even for a very simple thing like a string of characters, is not being used. Which means when in the past, when the in the United States, the FTC has found that companies are training models on data they shouldn't have, the only recourse for that is just to delete the model. So you'll hear people talk about the ag algorithmic death penalty or algorithmic disgorgement. And I mean, <laughs> to me, <laughs> thinking about what would be fair and restorative, we know that this, these models are trained on and perhaps memorize not only the work of individual artists or or images to which specific corporations hold the rights that they have not released in a way that we cannot guarantee, we, they can't guarantee, it has not been memorized, but also there's no way to remove specific items, right? So from my standpoint, if I, you know, were suddenly made queen of the world and we're like, hey, how would you remedy this situation? I mean, I think algorithmic disgorgement, deleting it is pretty much the only way you'd be able to. Absolutely. I <laughs> I agree. Like the, the only problem with that is that the, like if we were to move on with these models that are trained in an ethical way, I mm -hmm. think the first step would be to do the perform the algorithmic disgorgement on all these current and past models. However, the only issue there is that Stability AI released their diffusion, released it open source. So it's forever going to be out there. And that's something for the laws to deal with, like potential repercussions for things like that, because it could be argued that it's actually a very dangerous thing that they've had, they have done. Yes, we've talked quite a bit about uses of, of these models, which again, have is almost certainly going to hurt women the most. Women and people of color and other marginalized groups. So that's sort of, you know, what could be done today? I think also it might be helpful to think a little, or talk a little bit about why people would do this in the first place, right? So it's very expensive to train these models, right? It's very mm -hmm. expensive to do all the scraping. It's very expensive to store the data. It's very expensive to, to run models, both in terms of cost and also carbon output, because they, they run on energy, basically, which is a price we all pay. L great to think about. Why do people do this, right? So particularly with something like stability or, or OpenAI, we talked recently on the channel that OpenAI started as a nonprofit and is now a a limited profit company, and I think they've committed to only returning the VC money a hundred times over. So, you know, very limited profit. <laughs> and Stability got an enormous round of VC funding, OpenAI is getting VC funding. Why would these companies do super expensive things? Well, to get attention, to get speculative investment, right, seems to be the, the motivation behind these groups. And perhaps there are specific individuals who are really motivated by wanting to build models for specific uses, but both with large language models and with these generative image uses, the commercial applications seem to be 
fewer than the people who are very excited about the models often try to claim, right? Katria, you yes. mentioned illustrations, right? Very difficult to, to do with these models. You're probably going to end up having an easier time working with a human artist. Yeah, absolutely. Like with these image models, I want to <laughs> mention something I saw someone say on Twitter that really st stuck with me. Like these companies, like I think Stability AI specifically like mm -hmm. to put out statements saying that AI image generators democratize art. However, it, I would argue they democratize being a client because working with the these models, mm -hmm. while I, I don't doubt there's skill involved, there's maybe it could be a sort of compared to being an art director. Mm -hmm. However, you are like being a client or being an art director to artists and that's something i wanted to put out there i don't know that's such a weird argument to me because no one listen if you're watching this and you're like i'm kind of interested in art maybe i'll draw something draw something absolutely so the 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 thing is like how you mentioned we we are not quite sure what's behind like what's the idea goal or reasoning behind these models and well basically i think most if not all of them are commercial products at this moment and they are getting a lot of investments, speculative investments. I have read a lot and saw some videos saying that most, if not all of the developers behind these models are actually working together towards a common goal mm -hmm. of developing AGI, that's artificial general intelligence. Yeah. And supposedly it's really important to get out these image models as soon as possible and to further train the potential AGI on the data these models collect in the like in terms of user input and so the people using these models are further training them and providing more data for further research and while I have a lot of topics on that I'm not I shouldn't discuss because I'm not an expert I have to say that from my side it's not a good enough reason to go by the law and the ethics of it all and the that the technological advancement is not above consent and it's not above regulation I personally do not think that AGI is a thing that is possible or prudential. Again, that's just my stance as, as someone in the field. And also yeah. the... Mm, it's particularly tied up with ideas of a glorious future in which no one is sad because everyone's a robot, basically. And that, you know, th that's an interesting stance that you might take. But if you are hurting people immediately right here and justifying it by your, you yes. know, ends justify the mean argument, I personally don't think much of your praxis. <laughs> I think you need to rethink how you are as a human in the world. It's yeah, just my, my gentle urging to folks who are, are perhaps <laughs> in that boat. But you mentioned consent, and I think that that is something I'd really like to, to talk about is how how can we do better? All right, let's imagine, you know, folks want to continue to, to train image models, right? And I think there are generally good uses of computer vision, right? Particularly things like annotating scientific data sets, right? So um, while I was at Kaggle, we did a, a competition where we were annotating whale migrations from satellite images, right? Which is something that would be very difficult and tedious and boring and laborious for a human to do by hand. So automating that, you know, saves labor, right? As opposed to saving the cost of labor, which is a distinction that I think is important to make, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. The, the, these models still require the labor of artists to run. They just don't require the paying of artists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what does, what does better look like? Right. So folks, you know, are like, Hey, I'm really interested in generative art, which again, I think uh, an interesting art field. I'm, I'm not saying that it is, you know, bad to exist. I'm saying that it could be done better. What does that look like? And you brought up consent. And I think a consent model is a really good one. So do you want to talk a little bit more about imagining perfect world? Someone's like, Hey, Katria, I love your art. I love that illustrative style. I want to design, I don't know. I, I want to work with you to design a wallpaper or something. What, what does that future look like in a way that's good? If you would consent to it at all, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when we talk about like future potential ethically trained models, mm -hmm. ethical in terms of their relationship to like human automation, mm -hmm. human suffering, even I would maybe talk about all of that, like 
in three different categories. I will split it in three different categories. I'm mostly talking here, like mainly talking here about the relation to art industry because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So the, the first category is the training of the model, the, the behavior and limitations of the companies and developers behind them. And as we previously mentioned, I think the first step would be algorithmic discouragement of previous models. And then the training data sets for future models need to be 100% uh, consensual, properly licensed. If there is a license to be bought, the thing that people like to say here is that it would be a lot ex more expensive to do it that way, <laughs> but these companies do have a lot of investors, so a lot of money. So I don't see a problem there. If it really is a problem, they could always train these models on public domain or copyright free images. So if they want to train on copyrighted images, they need to acquire proper licenses. Now that could look like contacting, contacting the copyright holder and offering them a contract, a license for usage of this specific image in training this specific model, or maybe for training in the next five years of all the models that, that the company might put out and stuff like that. Every single detail mm -hmm. concerning the, the image, like concerning how it's going to be used needs to be worked out. Payment would depend on that, of course. Like if someone were to contact me to license my artwork for a Christmas card, we would need to work out how for how long the Christmas card is going to be sold, how many units are going to be sold, or on like which territories is going to be sold in how many stores and all the things like that. So mm -hmm. that needs to be translated into this specific case as well. Also, I would say these like generated images would need to be watermarked. Mm -hmm. I saw that China introduced some regulations to their <laughs> image models and they mentioned watermarking these images. And I think that's something that's basically <laughs> that would be a common good for everyone because th that would seriously mitigate the risk of uh, deep fakes and stuff like that. So if a company wants to inc incorporate these models into their workflow, they will still be able to get the output quicker, but they would need to have some human workers to modify those images. So they are more like they have more human authorship regardless to being completely machine made. So watermarks and the next category would be like the worker protections and government enforced regulations around these companies, because I don't believe we can realistically expect of these companies to uh, respect our professions and like take care of the people that might risk losing their jobs to automation. Mm -hmm. So one of the great things I've heard recommended talked about when it comes to this came from Carla Ortiz. She has been doing great work in advocating for ethical training of these models and stuff like that. She mentioned that perhaps government should impose regulations on companies wanting to use these models, saying that they can use only a certain, like that only a certain percentage of the work, workflow can be automated for the next X years, and then we could, as like the social securities and government funds and potential UBI or something catches up, we can let a bit of the workflow be automated. I'm gonna move on to the third category of how to make this, these models better for the people who are gonna end up using them in the workforce, which is artists. The main thing here would be that I think these companies got it all wrong, that the automation is supposed to be something well the promise of automation is that it's something that takes on the drudgery the menial work laborious work and frees us up to do intellectual work work we really enjoy and art really is that even in a professional capacity in the workplace but also i would say that the value of such art comes specifically from it from the human involvement in it all so i don't think that the image models that present you with finished pieces or do the art for you are something that artists are going to be excited about or something that it would cut costs for sure for the company yeah. but i think it would hurt their products in the long run the, the value of their products in the long run so the way for these models to be actually usable in the workforce i would say they need to take into account actual existing problems that the creatives face every day. So I cannot speak for concept artists or like texture artists, technical 
artists and stuff like that. I have only seen some mentions of potential AI augmentations, uh, programs they use, tools and stuff on the internet. And one of them that I really liked is that when you have to do a texture, that's a pattern, that's a repeating pattern. Maybe there could be an AI tool that generates that pattern for you after you've drawn like a small part of it. Mm -hmm. It could maybe randomize the, the shapes and stuff. We see a lot of that with digital brushes we are already used. So it's not, well, I personally don't see um, Luddite as an insult, but also I don't think it's right to call artists Luddites mm -hmm. because we use a bunch of different technologies every day, like incorporate them into our daily work lives and stuff like that. So we are familiar with a lot of AI powered tools, like in Photoshop, there's the content there tool that basically fills the background based on the, like how the entire background looks and it's great for removing objects or like expanding the image and stuff like that. I think that useful. Even if AI overtook the in entire industry, I don't think my work would be in any way better if I were to incorporate it in this way it's used now to generate entire images and stuff like that. I already don't draw as often as I physically can or as fast as I physically can because I believe that artwork depends on the like it's a physical and intellectual act. While I can draw it faster, I think my ideas deserve more time to develop or I need more time to work uh, on them or to get in the space. I honestly think the drawing process in on itself is right where it's supposed to be right now. There's not much that could be improved there. That's not to the detriment of a bunch of other things. I like a lot of the points you brought up there. I think a, a big one is, you know, people need to eat <laughs> and, you know, have oh, yeah. a place to live <laughs> and have their bills paid. Uh, so you, you brought up UBI, Universal Basic Income, for those who aren't familiar, as a, as a way to, to sort of address that. So yeah, uh, that would be great. I've, <laughs> I've seen that argument used numerous times, countless times, but it's always used as like, oh, well, we're, we're just going to get UBI, so it's going to be fine. And no, that's not how it happens. Like we, <laughs> theoretically, we might get UBI in like 15 years, but what are the people from automated professions going to do in, in that time? Not that previous automations weren't like that. I'm mm -hmm. just saying whenever automation happens, it's people who are professionally trained to do those a certain, those tasks that get replaced. And I think that any automation without regard for the uh, human lives affected is a tragedy. So even though we reap the benefits of previous automations, I still think that people who were left to left on their own suffered. So yes. I don't, I don't see any reason for why we should let it happen this time as well. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. I mean, the Luddites were labor activists, right? They were like, hey, these machines are yeah. killing children they, and we don't like that. Uh, they specifically asked for fair, better conditions, mm -hmm. fair pay mm -hmm. in the factories they worked in. And they would have succeeded in that for their bosses who had them killed. So yeah, yeah. let's hope this movement ends up a happier ending. Yeah. And I think labor rights and exploitation is a big problem in, in machine learning just overall, not just in, in the, the art sector, right? But a lot of a lot of machine learning models, you know, they generally work better with more data, which is why people are just scraping everything they can get their little grubby hands on. But it also includes for things that require a human annotation, human annotators. So Karen Howe has a great series of, of articles on, on AI as a new form of colonialism, right? Where the extraction of, of human labor and effort is taken very, very cheaply from countries that have been historically oppressed and colonized and continuing that pattern of harm. And also just sort of at a, at a societal level, continuing to reinforce the problem of wealth inequality. That's something I actually wanted to, to mention. And it's something I don't have an answer for. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be talked about. And I also don't think it's the reason to leave these models unregulated. So coming from Serbia, as mm -hmm. someone like from a country that some clients specifically look for when looking for cheap artists, I do believe that if this isn't regulated on a scale, a lot of these AI companies are going to try to outsource the licensing of these images. They might find someone from Serbia or from the global south to do the images in a certain artist's art style, 
like to do 50 images for a lot less than they would have to pay someone from the global north mm -hmm. um so companies like entertainment companies might also try to outsource this to like AI powered companies mm -hmm. from the global south and stuff like that. I don't know. There are certain regulations around that, like how much of the work can be outsourced in companies in which capacity and stuff like that. I'm not too knowledgeable about that, but I do hope that this is going to be regulated on an international scale because, well, um, Artwork aside, there's a lot of dangers with deep fakes and like personal data and personal photos that are inside. So hopefully that at least will prompt the governments around the world to work on this. The dangers of automation <laughs> systems are, it's never that it can do new stuff you couldn't do before, right? Like large language models can generate high school essays. We had the capability of generating high school essays before. The issue is scale, right? The issue is that it can be done cheaply and at a scale that it couldn't be done yes. before. Yes, yes. I actually heard precisely that from one of your videos and it made me think like, yeah, how a lot of, well, a lot of developers behind AI sort of use it as a gotcha. So like, oh, you're just paid because it can do it. It's a larger scale. <laughs> like, yes. Is that not a reason to be afraid? Uh, that, that sounds like something that needs to be taken account in, like be taken into account, like something that needs to be <laughs> regulated. Yeah, I mean, even just being self-preserving for the you know the software engineering domain. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And of course, you know, there's already at least one court case against Copilot for for using open source code against its licenses. And I don't think they're actually making specifically a copyright claim, but you know, very similar, right? Someone's labor is I being hope, used without their yes. consent to enrich someone else. I hope that someday soon we will see actual lawsuits or like class action lawsuits in this field. Sort of needed to at least sort some things out, like because right now we can't, we cannot talk in absolutes everything is up in the air we're in muddy waters right now so we can't say for certain this is illegal or this is not if you're democratizing something then maybe you should listen to a lot of people when they tell you something <laughs> sometimes i just get very very frustrated with people who are told directly that they're hurting other people and they don't care. Or even better, they tell you that you are not being hurt and you don't know what you're talking about, about your own yeah, experiences. That, that, that is arguably a lot, a lot worse. <laughs> All the arguments on the internet aside, I do feel like a lot of the danger for artists is currently in the mimicry of these users, like mm. posing as being a digital artist. Like art is very subjective, like a chef can be an artist in the way they prefer food. So I'm not going to say they, that users using these machines aren't artists, period. I will just say that them presenting themselves as digital artists, where the digital artist title comes with common understanding of what it is, what it entails, is very harmful to our professional reputations. There have been cases of clients getting uh, of both individual and like commercial clients mm -hmm. getting AI images presented to them as human-made artworks mm -hmm. and the the very common worry right now among artists in the like digital sphere is that we will have to jump through hoops to prove that the art we make is made by humans mm. and also i think it further obfuscates the image of art making people have in their heads like how that actually works earlier in the video when i talked about how i draw it's i mentioned the relationship with client in the drawing process, but the drawing itself consists of a lot of sketching, a lot of iterations, a lot of intellectual work that doesn't get translated to the paper. So <laughs> while it might look that I just sit down and a beautiful picture comes out of my fingers, it doesn't happen that way. And uh, the thing that I think would be very beneficial for artists right now is if we would maybe start educating the public more on what art making really is and what doing it professionally actually entails. And particularly if, you know, misrepresenting what you've produced for someone as being human made when it is in fact generated could also create issues with copyright because currently, certainly in the US, you cannot copyright generated art. Yes. So you are lying to your client. <laughs> Don't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, 
I am not sure about legalities around that, but it certainly is disingenuous. If those people don't want to think about others and how it's hurting them, they should think about how it's hurting themselves mm. because it certainly ruins their professional reputations, I would say. Yeah, we're all going to have to deal with, in pretty much every facet of our digital lives, more worse quality stuff. And how we do that is going to be a challenge for everyone. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the, one, of the very, one of the very important things I would like to mention in this video, mm. so I'm going to take the opportunity to do it before I forget, is that we are all worried. And I don't think that's, that worry is uncalled for. Mm. But I also don't think it should mean that we need to give up on our careers or like walk away from our passions and mm. our livelihoods. I do think that the human-made art is always going to have value. But for it to have monetary value, we need to fight right now. And one, make these companies see that. And two, make the government make these companies see that. And I want to make sure I'm not going, going too far from our meeting time, because I'm sure you are, are very busy. But I would say just, you know, call to action for all of you watching. If you're like, you know what? I like art. I want a specific piece of art for a particular reason. You. You can, you can commission artists. It's very easy. <laughs> like you yes. send an email, you like, you figure out, you know, timelines and budget and yes. you get beautiful art just for yourself. It is a great gift. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But I also wanted to say, yes, if you want custom art, it's a luxury product. And there are many artists with a lot, with a wide range of prices that are offering commissions, but keep in mind that it is a luxury product. And so it follows that it's gonna cost a lot more than something that's mass produced. So I understand that not everyone has enough money to be able to afford custom art. So I would say if you don't already know, a lot of artists do offer free resources as well, like free illustrations to be used in certain projects or like I've heard a lot of game developers say that this is going to help them finally create games so they don't have to cash out for artists and stuff like that. If you truly believe your project must be presented to the world and you don't have enough budget for an artist, like you should, but if you don't, there are certain websites on the internet where you can find like image packs and um, object packs to use in games that are very, very cheap, like even something like 100 illustrations for like $10. It's not going to be a custom piece of art. Other people are going to be able to use them in the games as well. But I think that's a wonderful compromise that leaves everyone happy because artists can, through multiple sales of those products, get paid fairly for their time and people have something that's more affordable to them in their projects. Also with the Lens app that we saw, people create like personalized <laughs> avatars and whatnot. There are sites that already let you create illustrated avatars for free, like Big Crew. And I'm sure a lot more. I would like to compile the list of the most popular sites where you can find free resources, but I'm just, I just want to put it out there for people who don't already know that it can be found. So either, please, either commission an artist or find a cheap or free resource that's put out there by the artists themselves or with their permission or wait just a little bit until these e ethical issues around these AI models are resolved. There is really no way to jump on it right now unless you're trying to take advantage of the fact that it is unregulated. Yeah. And a thing that can help guide decision making for everyone, right? Particularly in, in a time of increasing automation is if everyone did this, what would the outcome be? Right. And if everyone stopped paying artists and used these, these models that require artists work to work, right? We would not have any more good art. And that is something that would make me very sad because it's something that I value very much in my life. I love visual arts. I mean, I don't I don't show you all around my house, but I'll tell you, I have bought a lot of prints from artists and they bring me a lot of joy and delight. So something to think about, right? Just for, for all of you all out there who are like, oh yeah, but I want to use it a little bit. I mean, if you really want a specific image and it's something that you value, <laughs> we live in a capitalist society. You can exchange, you know, yeah. money for the thing that you value. Well, thank you very much for joining Catria. Before we sign off, I do want to say, is there anything you'd like to plug? You can follow me if you like cute, whimsical art of critters and like characters, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube at Katria Doodles. I would implore people to research everything they invest 
opinion <laughs> to really do their research and yeah follow follow real artists online we all share our art to be seen and enjoyed for free online so if you do like art there's an abundance of it online already yes there there's more art on the internet than any one person could ever look at with their human eyes in their human lifetime so i don't know seek it out that was i remember when uh, we do have to wrap up but i remember the first time that i got access to an internet connection in high school i was a weird little nerd and i was like i want to see fantasy art <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. That's what I did, right? Like the first time I got access to, to an internet connection with like consistency, I would go to websites and look at fantasy art and it brought me a lot of joy as a weird little lonely kid and well, high schooler. I was not that young. I don't know. It's something that I've always valued very much in my life and I very much appreciate the artist too who spent time making it and I value y'all's labor. So I'm hopeful for a better future. My heart is full. <laughs> that is really <laughs> lovely to hear. Also, I really love your style. If anyone hasn't already checked out Katria, I would say it's a very whimsical, folksy, illustrative style that fits very well with my personal style. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining today, Katria. Thank you very oh, thank much you to everybody for, having for watching. Me. And some calls to action. Consider not using some of these apps at the, the behest of people whose data was harvested for it. And also for many other reasons that we've talked about on the channel. And pay an artist. Yes. Yes. And do do your research on like mm -hmm. a lot of people are trying to do good things and to involve themselves in like some actionable steps. So do your research. Concept Art Association seems to be at the forefront in mm -hmm. the US right now. So check them out and research everything. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining Catrail. Thank you all for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.